Welcome to the first lesson for AQA A2 spectroscopy, which is Unit 11. The first lesson is on mass spectroscopy. If you have your official textbook, you can look at pages 132 to 136 to help. Our lesson objectives for this lesson are first of all to understand that the fragmentation of a molecular ion gives rise to a characteristic relative abundance spectrum that may give information about the structure of the molecule, and then to know that the more stable X plus species give higher peaks. This is limited to carbocation and acylium ions, which are carbonyl ions. Before we start with the new knowledge, it'd be helpful to have a quick recap of what we learnt in AS about mass spectroscopy. So I'd like you to pause the video here and see if you can identify the labels that should go in these boxes. So hopefully you've managed to identify these various stages. So the first thing that happens, if you look on this left-hand side, here is that the sample has to be injected into the mass spectroscopy and at that point it needs to be vaporised. I apologise, it doesn't quite fit in the box. So it looks a bit messy, but you get the idea. After it's been vaporised, it then needs to be ionised and that happens here. So ionisation is where a um, high-energy beam of electrons is um, projected in the direction of the sample and then it knocks off electrons to cause ions. Once you've got the ions, it's then accelerated. So the ions are accelerated, they're made to go a lot faster. They go towards a positively charged plate. After they've been accelerated so that they're fast enough, they then go into this magnetic field here, which causes deflection, because charged particles get deflected in a magnetic field. And the amount of, that they get deflected will depend on their mass to charge ratio. Once you've deflected the ions, they then travel down here towards the detector at the end. So you get detection is the last uh, stage that happens in the mass spectroscopy. And at that point, a current is generated, and that current is proportional to the abundance of the ion that is detected. So here's the steps. Um, laid out for you, and I apologise for the mistake, I've just noticed a mistake on there, so you'd say the sample rather than the ample, so I've just corrected that rather crudely on here. So the first step is vaporisation. So the atoms, as I said before, go into the mass spec, they need to be vaporised because they need to be in a vapour state, they need to be gaseous. Second step is ionisation, so the sample is bombarded with high energy electrons and this creates positive ions. At that point, the fragment, you can also have fragmentation. But we're not worrying about that right now, because we're just recapping what we did at AS. So once you've got the ions, you then have step three, which is acceleration. An uh, electric potential is used to um, accelerate the ions, so they pick up speed and they go down the mass spectrometer. Step four, they're then deflected, so an electromagnet is used, and in this, mag this generates a magnetic field, and this deflects the positive ions. And how much they're deflected depends on their mass-to-charge ratio. Now you have to be careful here, and you should always specify that it's their mass-to-charge ratio. Some people simplify at this point and just talk about the fact that they are deflected based on their mass. But it's really their mass-to-charge ratio. And we met this in AS because we talked about the fact that you sometimes get a peak at um, half of the value for elements. So if you had an element that had a mass of, say, 80, you would get a peak at half of that, which would be smaller, but you'd get a peak at about half of that value, so at 40, because in some cases, in quite rarely, but it does happen, you would get, manage to get two electrons knocked off. So you'd have a peak at, at m divided by 2z. Once you've deflected, it's then detected, so the ions hit the detector plate, and this causes an electric current, because an electric current is a flow of either electrons or ions. So as the ions hit the detector plate, you get an electric current generated. And how much that current, that reading of that current, is proportional to the abundance of the ions. That means the more ions you have there, the higher the electrical current, and this generates our mass spectra. So we're just going to talk about ionisation in slightly more detail than we had last year. So this is the new knowledge that you now need to know, or part of it. So when an electron is lost, the resultant ion is a cation. And this is obvious, because we've lost an electron, so the resultant ion you have is going to be positive. And we 
talked about that last year, but we didn't specifically talk about it as being a cation. The other thing we didn't really discuss last year is that because that molecule has lost a single electron, the ion that's left has got an unpaired electron. And you should know from your organic chemistry that when we've got a species with an unpaired electron, that we call this a radical. So this cation is, a, it, is a, also a radical. So because of this, we describe the product as a radical cation. And we represent this by using m plus dot. Now, if you look very carefully at that, here where I'm pointing, you've got an m, so m just means a molecule. You've got a positive charge on it, and you've also got a dot. So the positive charge obviously means it's lost an electron, so it's positively charged. And that little dot means that it's a radical. So last year we w did talk about fragmentation, but we didn't talk about it in terms... We didn't actually represent it with an equation. So this is new stuff that we're going to do now. So we said in the last slide that we can represent the radical molecular cation by M plus with a radical. So it's M plus dot. Now when we fragment, this M plus dot here breaks up into two fragments. Okay? And we're just using X and Y. It doesn't matter what X and Y. They're just half of the molecule or part of the molecule. It doesn't, you don't have to worry about what they actually are. But when that radical cation breaks up, so this M plus here, when it breaks up, you get X plus, which is a positive cation. So half of the fragment will have this positive charge. And the other half of the fragment will have the radical. It will have the unpaired electron. So one of the parts has got an unpaired electron, and there's a radical, and the other one has got a positive charge. Now, if you think back about what happens in a mass spectrometer, it's only the positively charged species, it's only the ion, that is going to be detected in the mass spectrometer. Because the Y that we've got here has an unpaired electron, but it doesn't have a charge, so it's not going to be affected by that magnetic field. So only the positively charged fragment will be detected in the mass spectrum. So now we're going to talk about the mass spectrum that you actually see. And we did talk about this last year. So a molecular iron is the peak with the highest number. It's not the tallest peak. You have to be careful. Lots of people in an exam get this mixed up. It's not the tallest peak. So it's the one with the highest number. So I'm just going to draw you a very crude mass spectrum. So if you have your mass spectra there, So the axes on the left, oh sorry, on the, the y-axis, so it would be relative abundance, remember, and the x-axis is going to be the mass divided by the charge. So if we had a typical mass spec here, so we just draw some random peaks, and I apologise for my dodgy drawing here. So you can see, I'll just draw in blue here, the molecular ion would be responsible for this peak in blue here. So the molecular iron would be the one on the right hand side. In fact the tallest peak is what we call the base peak and this represents the most abundant cation, so the one that's there the most. And which one is the most abundant is influenced by a couple of factors. First of all the bond that's broken to form the fragment influences it. So if you have a really weak bond, that's more likely to break than a strong bond. So the fragment's more likely to form as a result of a weak bond breaking. So you need to think about the, the bond strength. It's also influenced by how stable the fragment is. So you should know from your organic work that alkyl groups are electron releasing. And because of this, they're going to stabilise the cation. So a tertiary cation will be more stable than a secondary cation, which in turn is more stable than a primary cation. The other influence is that carbonyl groups stabilise the fragment. We call these acyllium ions. So carbonyl groups are quite stable. So you'll quite often find the, the fragment that forms will have the positive charge on the carbon of the carbonyl. And that's because the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. So you've already got a delta plus on the carbon and a delta minus on the oxygen and this stabilizes the cation. So here's just a few of the common fragments you might find in a mass spec. So a methyl group has a mass of 15 so you might find a drop of 15 in the 
mass spec or you might find a peak at 15. For an ethyl group which is CH2, CH3 you might see a peak at 29. If you had a propyl group that would give 43. You can also see a fragment at 43 for a, um, a C double bond O, CH3 and at 57 for a C double bond O and then an ethyl group off of that. So here's an example mass spec for ethanol and I'm just going to quickly draw in the um, molecular structure of ethanol so you can have a look at it. And of course here I do have to apologise for my drawing. It does look like a three-year-old's drawn it but you get the idea. You've got two, so you've got a CH3 group here, you've got a CH2 group there, you've got an oxygen and then you've got a hydrogen. So if you look at this there are various peaks you should be able to see. So this group here, if this bond between the two carbons breaks, you will have a fragment of one carbon and three hydrogens. And that's going to be here at 15. So you can see a small peak there. And you can see that it's not a very tall peak. So we know that this fragment's not particularly stable. So if you broke that bond, the other fragment you would have is one carbon and two hydrogens and an oxygen and a hydrogen. So that would give us we've got 12, 13, 14 plus 16 for your oxygen that gives us 30 and you'd then have another hydrogen that would give 31. So you can see we've got this very big peak here at 31 that corresponds to your CH2 OH. So obviously because that's much taller that's a more stable peak. Now the other you can see on the right hand side so the molecular mass of ethanol is 46 you can see here right on the right hand side is the molecular ion and then there's another peak there where you've lost one hydrogen to give 45. Now you can form that in, in various ways any of these hydrogens so you can have this one, you can have this one, this one, this one, this one or this one any of those hydrogens could have been lost to form that peak at 45. So they're the main peaks that you see. You do also see these other little ones here but we're not going to get too stressed about those at the moment. Okay so the last thing we need to talk about is isotopes in the mass spec. Um, so we find in our mass spec that sometimes there's small peaks to the right of the molecular peak. So again you're going to have to put up my very crude drawings, I apologise for that. But here's a very crude drawing of a mass spec and I've left the axes off for simplicity this time but you should know that this one here, the y-axis, is relative abundance and then this x-axis here is the mass charge ratio. So here we have on the right hand side, this is our molecular peak. Now sometimes, now we did say that it was the one to the far right, but sometimes because of isotopes you get a very very small. Now on this scale, if this was, when we're talking about carbon, that peak there you wouldn't be able to see because you should know that carbon-13 is 1%, so 1% of natural carbon is carbon-13. So if this peak here, this molecular peak, had a height of 100, and there was only one carbon in there, so if we had like methanol, which only had one carbon, and this peak here was a height of 100, then 1% of those methanol molecules would, instead of having carbon-12 in, would have carbon-13. So instead of weighing what methanol is, what uh, carbon plus um, four hydrogens, so that gives us 16, plus 16 for the oxygen, that will give us 32. So if this peak here was at 32 and a height of 100, we'd have this tiny peak to the right of it at 33, where instead of being carbon-12, it's carbon-13. So for a compound with one carbon atom in, that little peak for the isotope will be 1% of the height of your molecular iron peak. If you had two carbons, so in our previous example we looked at ethanol, because there's two carbons in there, then you would have the, the this little peak here would be 2% of the height of the peak. So you can use the height of that peak to work out how many carbons there are in the molecule. So we're at the end of the lesson, and just to remind you what the lesson objectives were, so hopefully you can take these off that you can do them. If not, you'll have to go back and have a look at your textbook or watch the video again. So what we wanted you to be able to do was understand that the fragmentation of a molecule, molecular ion gives rise to characteristic relative abundance spectrum and that that may give information about the structure of the molecule.
and you also be able to know that the more stable X plus species give higher peaks and that's limited to carbocations and acelium ions.